So I thought it'd be a good idea to take a break from learning the actual history and go into another exam question. This one specifically being about uh, Nicholas II and his uh, politics by 1914. This is a, uh, an extract question, an extract question, and uh, obviously it's because it's 30 marks. It's you do three extracts, but I figured that I wouldn't have enough time to do one video where I looked at three extracts in enough detail. So I'm just going to do one extract and if you want the other two extracts analyzing fully for you, then just just let me know and I'll do and I'll do more. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is read the question and then I'm going to read the source. Okay? So using your understanding of historical context, assess how convincing the arguments in these three extracts are in relation to the political situation in Russia by 1914. Relatively nice, it's quite a nice essay question. So you're really going to be asked, oh my lord. So you're being asked about, you're being asked about the political situation in Russia by 1914. So let's just go ahead and read this extract in its entirety. Okay, so this is extract C. This is a uh, adapted from uh, Grenville's um, a World of History of the 20th Century, Volume 1, Western Dominance, 1900-1945. Okay, from 1980. So, in 1905, the October Manifesto promised to bring life to a genuinely parliamentary body with whom the Tsar would share power. There were four meetings of the Parliamentary Assembly. The Duma of 1906, the second Duma of 1907, the third from 1907 to 1912, and the last from 1912 to 1917. Okay. In the first Duma, uh, par a new party emerged, the Constitutional Democrats, or Cadets. But the Tsar would have nothing to do with the Constitutional Party or their leader, uh, Pavel um, Milyukov. After a short second Duma, which saw a strengthening of revolutionary socialists, the Tsar simply changed the electoral rules, ensuring tame conservative majorities in the third and fourth Dumas. The opportunity of transforming Russia into a genuinely constitutional state by collaborating with moderate liberal opinion was spurned by the Tsar. As long as Nicholas II reigned, a genuine constitutional change on the Western model was blocked. <clears throat> okay, this is quite a nice extract, really, because if you've watched how to answer the extract videos that I've uploaded, you'll know that what we're trying to do is pick out arguments from this extract. Pick out arguments that we can we can either agree or disagree with when we use our historical knowledge, our historical context, okay? And there are loads of little ones that we can pick out. The mark scheme picks out, I think, five or six different uh, different points. But if you want to fully detail and analyze five or six, then that's going to take you a long time. Generally, if you can aim for about three or four different extracts, then, and you can analyze it and compare it with historical context to assess how convincing they are, then you tend to be the you tend to be able to get the higher grades. So, what we're going to do? So we're going to have a look at this again, okay? And then we're going to have a look at, and we're going to start highlighting different areas in which we can find arguments, okay? So the October Manifesto promised to bring life to a genuinely parliamentary body with whom the Tsar would share power. So let's just underline that for a start, okay? So this is our first argument we can pick out. And we can use our historical context to to really bash this argument a little bit because it's suggesting here, it's arguing that they would share power with the Tsar, okay? And this is what the October Manifesto promised. You could argue on the face of it, so on the face of it, so prima facie, so prima facie, which is just, just means on the face of it, okay? Uh, the October Manifesto, the October Manifesto, so did promise, did promise uh, uh, an elected Duma, okay, an elected Duma, and it is specific that it did have, it would have the power 
would have the power to enact legislation. Have the power power to enact legislation. Okay. And this is convincing. So the argument here, the argument is saying that they would the, the parliamentary body would share power with the Tsar. And the October Manifesto did promise this. It did say that the Duma would enact legislation. Okay. However, this is less convincing because whilst the October Manifesto made this promise, the uh, fundamental laws of April 1905. So of April 1905, the fundamental laws, the fundamental laws um, made it clear, made it clear that the Tsar would be autocratic, okay? Made it clear that the Tsar would be autocratic. Tsar would be autocratic. So whilst it's true, yes, the October Manifesto did promise a share of power, they were had the power to enact legislation, they were an elected Duma, this was still... Um, this was still frauded almost, like scuppered by the fundamental laws that the Tsar enacted, where he could also dissolve the Duma whenever he wants. I'm not going to write that down because we need a bit of room. He could dissolve and he could make legislation himself. Okay? So we can look at that as the first argument. Okay? So I'm going to change colour for the second argument. Let's go for a nice blue. Okay? So there were four meetings of Parliament of the Parliamentary Assembly. 1906, 1907, 1907-12, to 12, 17 This isn't really an argument, this is just a statement of fact, okay? And also here, uh, the the first Duma, a new party emerged, the Const this, this is also just a statement of fact, okay? But the Tsar would have nothing to do with the Constitutional Party or their leader, okay? Again, you can maybe make an argument here, but... I'm not going to. I'm going to pick out other ones because I feel like there are better ones in here. Okay, So, after a short second Duma, which saw the strengthening of revolutionary socialists. This is a very interesting point. Okay, So, after a short second Duma, it saw the, the, we see the strengthening of revolutionary socialists. Well, what do we know from our historical evidence? Well... For a start, this first bit here, we do know it was a short Duma. It was 1907, okay? We saw the strengthening of revolutionary socialists. Well, did we see the strengthening of revolutionary socialists? Because uh, socialism, so revolutionary... Revolutionary socialism was not very popular was not very popular in, in 1905, uh, very popular in 1905. This gained, it gained popularity later on. So it gained popularity uh, later on. So to say that it, it we saw a strengthening of revolutionary socialists, this might be true. This might they might have been a strengthening of revolutionary socialists, but the way this is argued is suggesting that there there it was somehow a kind of problem for the Tsar that there was these revolutionary socialists. Uh, not really, since the there wasn't much opposition in terms of revolutionary opposition in 1905. We saw the 1905 revolution, which wasn't revolutionary socialism. There were different things, okay? So I think that maybe is a point to suggest maybe why this is less convincing. The Tsar simply changed the electoral rules, ensuring tame conservative majorities in the third and fourth Dumas. Now this is also another argument that I want to pick out. I'm going to use a lighter blue for this one. So ensuring tame conservative majorities in these two Dumas, okay? And this is true, and this argument is suggestively convincing, because because there have been tame conservative majorities in the third and fourth Dumas, these Dumas were more productive, okay? These Dumas were more productive, were more productive. Because if we think about it, these two Dumas lasted, one lasted 1907 to 1912, the other 1912 to 1917, 
we see more productive doomers. So you can maybe slip that in as a, a little argument for why this is probably a more convincing argument. I'm gonna go with I think I think this orange here. Okay. So the last little bit is where we're gonna really pick out some really nice arguments, okay? So the opportunity of transforming Russia into a genuine constitutional state by collaborating, uh, it was spurned by the Tsar, okay? This is the argument that, oh, that was not good. This is the argument that the Tsar um, didn't want to create a constitutional monarchy. So the Tsar, this is basically arguing the Tsar did not want a constitutional monarchy. The Tsar did not want a constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy. Okay. Well, we can also add in this little bit here. As long as Nicholas reigned, genuine constitutional change in the Western model was blocked. Okay, so this is all really one argument here. Well, we see this. This is definitely convincing by evidence. Well, what evidence of what, what understanding of historical context do we have to suggest that this is a convincing argument? Well, the main one is the fundamental laws. So the fundamental the fundamental laws made it very clear, they made it very clear that Nicholas did not want any kind of constitutional monarchy. Okay? That Nicholas did sorry, did not want constitutional monarchy constitutional ooh, it's a long one constitutional monarchy I guess before that you could argue that the October Manifesto did effectively promise a constitutional monarchy but was scuppered by the fundamental laws which is very similar to the argument made up here with the October Manifesto and the fundamental laws here so overall what would we say about this extract well I think it, we would argue that uh, this argument up here, okay, was uh, on the face of it um, convincing. However, when looking at it a little bit deeper, the fundamental laws suggest that it wasn't convincing. After a short second Duma, which saw the strengthening of revolutionary socialists, I'd argue personally that that wasn't a convincing argument. I want, I'm not convinced that we saw a huge strengthening of revolutionary socialists in this period of time. We saw we see that later on in the history of Russia. Oh, this that's not good. Here we go. And then we've got here about the third. I would argue that that is convincing. That the tame conservative majorities in the third and fourth Dumas did lead to more productive Dumas. So we have here that because he changed the electoral rules and he did ensure conservative majorities, and we can prove that by saying that these conservative majorities are allowed for the Dumas to last longer. And then the final one, the final one, which I think is the clearest argument of all of them, is talking about how the Tsar just did not want a constitutional monarchy, which I think is made very clear by the fundamental laws. And you can go into a lot of details about the fundamental laws and everything around there. So this is generally how we could look at this source, uh, this extract question, sorry, and analyze it, okay? If you want me to do it for the other two extracts, of course I'll do it, but this is just, I just picked one at random, I picked one from um, a, a bit of history that we've already studied, and I picked this wrong extract at random. I thought this was probably the nicest of the three. I don't mind going over the other two as well. This seems to be quite nice and easy to understand the points. So uh, stay tuned for other videos where we continue with the actual history, and we start looking at the Russian Revolution and, and the impact of World War One, and then we move on to the A-level section where we start looking at Stalin and Khrushchev.